Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. I'm very excited to have a guest appearance on today's Research Spotlight episode. In these episodes, specialist guests give talks on their recently published work. In today's episode, I'm thrilled to have with us Dr. Josh McManus. Josh graduated from the University of Michigan in 2014 with a BS in chemistry, where he worked in the group of Professor Corinna Schindler on the synthesis of diaryl-heptanoids. Subsequently, he completed his doctoral work in the lab of Dave Nishevitz in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In July, Josh will be starting a postdoc in the Carrera Group at ETH Zurich. With that, I'll hand it over to Josh. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me to talk about a project I recently finished up as a graduate student in the Nishevitz lab at UNC. This project involved the homobenzylic oxidation of alkylarine substrates using dual photoredox and cobalt catalysis. So as many of you are well aware, photoredox mechanisms typically proceed via a radical based process. And oftentimes when aromatic substrates are utilized in these reactions, we typically see formation of a benzylic radical. And this can happen through a multitude of pathways, including radical-based decarboxylations, H-atom abstraction of the labile benzylic protons, or via deprotonation of the oxidized arine radical cation. And while we wanted to form functionality at the homobenzylic position rather than the benzylic position, we thought maybe formation of this radical can actually act as a functional handle to install functionality at the homobenzylic position through the utilization of this benzylic radical. And we hypothesized the way that this would occur would be through a CH functionalization pathway via either this type of H atom abstraction process or via radical cation deprotonation. And so we envisioned utilizing the dual catalytic system to first perform a, an in situ dehydrogenation to access a styrene intermediate, wherein then the same pot, it can be converted to the homobenzylic ketone. We were able to achieve this transformation using catalytic amounts of both our photooxidant and the cobalt catalyst in the presence of two equivalents of lithium nitrate, five mole percent of a Brownstead acid additive, in a 921 mixture of acetonitrile water under blue light irradiation. And so simple aromatic substrates such as propylbenzene and heptylbenzene could be easily utilized in this reaction. Other arenes such as this toluol derivative can be converted to the homobenzylic ketone as well. This substrate also worked nicely in the reaction and I want to point out that for this particular case we didn't see any oxidation of the tertiary benzylic position. We only saw formation of the desired ketone product at the homobenzylic position. Substrates such as this bromoarine were well tolerated. We could also form functional groups such as this uh, dicarbonyl species. And these biaryl linkages were also well tolerated in this reaction. And so the way we think this reaction proceeds is first through promotion of the ground state acridinium to its excited state using blue light irradiation. The excited state acridinium is then oxidizing enough to oxidize the nitrate anion to the nitrate radical. The nitrate radical then performs an H atom abstraction at the benzylic position of the aromatic substrate to then give a benzylic radical and an equivalent of nitric acid. The benzylic radical can then be intercepted by a cobalt-3 hydride to evolve hydrogen gas and give a styrene intermediate. The cobalt-2 species and the acridine radical can then engage in an electron transfer event where the ground state acridinium is formed and a cobalt-1 species is generated. The cobalt-1 species is then protonated from in situ generated acid to give the cobalt-3 hydride, which then closes the cobalt catalytic cycle. The styrene can then re-engage in an acridinium cycle to then form the olefin radical cation, which is trapped with water at the anti-Markovnikov position, whereupon a similar type of hydrogen evolving catalytic cycle, we can then form the desired product. It's worth noting that if we use the proposed styrene intermediate as the starting material for this reaction, that we do see good conversion to the expected homobenzylic ketone product. Now, unfortunately, during reaction optimization, we saw quite a few inconsistencies between duplicate trials. So we turned to reaction progress kinetic analysis to determine why exactly this was happening. 
So the red trace at the top indicates the standard reaction conditions run for 20 hours. And the blue trace with the triangular markers indicates the same excess experiment, which was run to mimic partial consumption of the propylbenzene starting material, along with partial conversion to the desired ketone product. And so if we apply a time offset of this same excess experiment, we see that it does not line up well with the uh, standard condition curve. And what this indicates to us is that we are not seeing product inhibition in this particular reaction. And what we expect is causing inconsistencies between duplicate experiments is actually decomposition of one of our, our catalysts in this reaction. And so we expected that it was likely the cobaloxime that is decomposing throughout the course of this reaction. And we thought perhaps it could be at the protonation of the cobalt-1 to form the cobalt-3 hydride step that is causing this to occur. And so we found that if we switch from using nitric acid as a bronsted acid additive to dichloroacetic acid, we see better consumption of propylbenzene and in turn better conversion to the desired ketone product. And we think in this case that because dichloroacetic acid is less harsh of an acid and less harsh of an oxidant than nitric acid, that we expect more mild reaction conditions and a more facile protonation of the cobalt-1 to give the cobalt-3 hydride and continuation of the desired reaction conditions. And so we expect that same principle to hold true for the second catalytic step, where now formation of the ketone would follow the same type of principle. Next, we turn to Stern-Volmer analysis to probe the electron transfer events that we're proposing for this type of catalytic cycle. So we propose that the nitrate anion is oxidized to the nitrate radical and that the styrene is oxidized to the olefin radical cation. We do acknowledge that it's possible that the propylbenzene starting material could be oxidized to the arene radical cation. However, we don't expect that to be an operative mechanistic pathway. So when plotting these experiments, we see that the styrene and the nitrate anion both quench the excited state acridinium on the order of 10 to the 9 per molar per second. We do also see that the propylbenzene starting material does quench the excited state acridinium on the order of the 10 to the 7 per molar per second. However, due to the extremely short lifetime of the acridinium photooxygen, we don't expect this to be an operative elementary step in this reaction mechanism. And so if we take a look at these electron transfer events, we do expect that these first two are viable pathways, and we do not expect um, ultimately that the substrate is being directly oxidized under these types of reaction conditions. The next electron transfer step that we wanted to probe in this mechanism was the electron transfer event between acridinium and the uh, cobalt catalyst. So we were able to generate the acridine radical using a stoichiometric amount of cobaltocene. We then were able to use stop flow kinetic analysis by quickly mixing the acridine radical with the cobalt 2 complex. And what we see is in the mixing experiment by this dark blue line here, that nearly all of the acridine radical is consumed and that the blue line closely matches the trace shown by the ground state acridinium, which would be the final product of this electron transfer event. So while we weren't able to determine the actual rate constant for this electron transfer event because this happened faster than the instrument's detection limit, we do know that it's at least on the order of 10 to the 7 per molar per second. And so if we apply all these electron transfer rates to our proposed mechanism, we see that the nitrate anion is quickly oxidized to the nitrate radical. Additionally, the styrene is quickly oxidized to the olefin radical cation. And we know that the electron transfer event between acridinium and cobalt happens at least on the order of magnitude of 10 to the 7 per molar per second. And we acknowledge that direct oxidation of the arene to the arene radical cation would result in a highly acidic intermediate that would could easily be deprotonated to form a benzylic radical, which could participate in the proposed downstream reactivity. However, due to the low quenching constant 
of this particular process, we don't expect this to be the operative mechanism. However, if it turns out we switch to a more electron-rich aromatic species, such as tetralin rather than probobenzene, this now quenches the excited state acridinium on the order of 10 to 9 per molar per second, similar to that of lithium nitrate or the styrene intermediate. So now if we replace this propylbenzene substrate with tetralin, we now can expect that this type of electron transfer event will occur more readily and that it could participate in downstream reaction without the addition of lithium nitrate. And so this actually turns out to be true. So we were able to form the 2-tetralone in 86% yield without utilizing lithium nitrate, and we're actually able to run this with only 5 mole percent of the cobalt oxime rather than 10 mole percent, and for only 8 hours compared to 20 hours. And so this ended up holding true for a number of different substrates, including um, several different types of protected phenols, protected anilines, as well as substrates that have ester functionality, sulfones, and tosylamides. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion on a project I was very excited to work on as a graduate student in the Neshevitz lab. I would like to thank Matt for inviting me to speak about this project. Um, I'd like to thank my former advisor, Professor David Neshevitz at UNC for being a great boss throughout my five years as a graduate student. Uh, big thanks to former Neshevitz lab members, Dr. Jeremy Griffin and Dr. Alexander White. Um, these two worked on the project with me and were um, a great help throughout the, the entire process. Thank you to these funding agencies, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you've enjoyed this research spotlight with Dr. Josh McManus. If you're interested in presenting your own published work through a research spotlight video, feel free to contact us by email. As always, follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time!